Let me start off by saying that Seder night, of course, is not a service. Seder night is not a service. Seder night is an experience that our children have to, uh, so that ch children have a, hopefully, a wonderful lifelong memory from their Seder night. Thanks. Lifelong, that's what we're looking for. They really can come away from Seder night and feel that they've got something that's going to give them uh, all the way into the future. So can I just ask everybody to mute themselves, or I can mute everybody. Okay, great. So what we're looking for is to make it the most magnificent experience that we can. Remember our mitzvah on Seder night is is to teach our children to narrate the story and to bring it alive for them. And they've got to learn three key points. Three key points. They've got to learn Imun and Hashem. They've got to learn faith in Hashem. That Hashem revealed himself and Hashem demonstrated to the Egyptians and to Klal Yisrael that he runs the world, first and foremost. By the way, you might find it useful to have a pen and paper. We're going to throw lots of ideas at you. Um, but we're also recording this as well. Faith in Hashem. Secondly, they've got to know that Hashem takes care of us as individuals. Uh, in contrary to Egyptian pagan ideology, that there was a God who abandoned the world, that was one view. This is a God who was very intrinsically involved in the world. And they've got to know that we became the ambassador nation for the world. Those three points we have to communicate to save night in through the story, belief in Hashem. Hashem existed and we saw his power firsthand. That Hashem has control and interest in the individual details. And thirdly, that we became his ambassador nation through the world. Through the, through the experience. Our goal on Say the Night is not to replace the Say the Night experience. Everything I'm going to tell you tonight is not about replacing, but enhancing the Say the Night experience. I must compliment uh, Mrs. Glick and the school sent me through the magnificent material they've sent through. I love the idea of those discussion points throughout the whole Seder. Really wonderful ideas. I'm going to steal some of them myself for future presentations. Beautiful ideas. But our goal is to enhance, not to replace. And that's very, very important. Let me say a couple of points of preparation, then we'll get to some practical ideas. First of all, everybody runs their own Seder night differently, but over the years we have found that during the actual Seder, before the meal, it's very useful to have a table that is free from clutter. So we actually don't bring out crockery or cutlery at all until the actual meal. The crockery, the cutlery is very beautifully wrapped up in uh, with serviettes and a little bit of ribbon from pre-prepared, so it comes out quite quickly, but it's very nice to have the table clutter-free for the actual narration of the Angoda itself. And that means that um, it's less likely there are wine spills, although inevitable, but nonetheless, it's very important. Uh, number one. Number two, I don't know, no, no one ever likes this idea, but it's a good idea, probably less relevant this year. If you've got lots of guests around your table, I find it's great to have the same Haggadah. The same Haggadah. I always recommend the Art Scroll family Haggadah, the paperback family Haggadah. It's a great one to have. It makes it much easier for the person running the Seder to, if everybody's got the same Haggadah. There's plenty of time throughout the whole of Pesach to spill your wine on other Haggadahs. I don't make it a rule but that makes it much easier. Now, let's talk about some preparation ahead of the day because the anticipation ought to build. So for example, it's great for children to make placemats before Save Night. You could download some pictures from any of the Torah Tots websites or H might have some, but pictures of Yitzhak Mitzrayim or the Avdut, and you can create placemats. If you've got a laminator, and you can laminate those placemats. And it's great because it helps build the anticipation for the day and keeps the children busy um, ahead of the day. Another thing that we did over the years is we put pictures on our windows. We did this for all of Chagim. And uh, pictures on our windows uh, for the up and coming Chag. It was quite funny actually once. Um, we were a little bit tardy once in taking the pictures down. And one of our neighbors actually knocked on our door and said, um, Purim was three weeks ago. Do you mind changing your display? It's a great thing to do from a parenting perspective because it gives the children a sense of pride in their Yiddishkeit and it excites them about it. Uh, and uh, so another thing which we did over the years, which created these large um, cossot, shape of a cos, shape of a wine glass, and um, they were numbered one to four, and different children picked them up during the Seder for the Arba Kossot. I know that you've got these cards to take you through the different stages of the Seder as well. That's a variation on the theme. But these are ideas that enhance ahead of time. Another idea which is really good is to ask the children to prepare a couple of, depending on the, on the ages of the children, a couple of mini sketches. Mini sketches which you can bring into the Seder as and when it's relevant. So for example, there could be an interview with one of the Egyptians 
the plague of blood. It could be an interview with one of the of Klal Yisrael when um, going through the hard back-breaking labor, an interview with Klal Yisrael at that moment of redemption. Ask your children, should be very, very short, not more than probably two minutes a maximum, otherwise everybody gets a bit bored. They can be some very simple props. A towel or a sheet functions very well, some kind of ancient um, type of dress and a piece of string and a bamboo stick for a, a staff of some sort. But these are some of the things you can do ahead of time to involve the children and build up the anticipation. We always have nash on the table. And in, in fact, the halacha encourages, um, the halacha encourages nash on the table of four, uh, for the children. We actually award nash for good questions. And again, we encourage our children ahead of time to prepare questions. Normally, of course, you give nash for good answers. But here, we want to encourage people to ask questions. Remember, that's the theme of the evening. The children ask questions, and we actually respond to those questions. And it doesn't really matter if we don't know the answer. That's fine. It doesn't matter at all. But to encourage them to ask questions, especially children who are at maybe key stage two, to look through the Haggadah and to ask some questions for which they don't have the answers. That's fine. It will it create some discussion. And ask each child to prepare a couple of questions for each night, and we will award Nash for good questions. Okay, that's by way of general preparation for Sedma. And now I'm going to share with you different ideas for dramatizing the Seder. Now, I've actually, rather than, there's two ways of presenting this, I could take you through the Haggadah um, and do it that way. I've actually done it slightly differently. I've prepared in different segments, some interactive ideas, some discussion points, some drama points, and some stories. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to, uh, I'll show you how to use those in different points through the Seder itself. I'm going to start off with four different interactive ideas. Uh, four different interactive ideas. I wouldn't necessarily use all of these. I definitely wouldn't use all of these in one night. And to be honest, you know, I'm quite tempted to only share with you two of them this year and save two for next year. Because I don't know, I get invited back, what will I think of next year? But I'll share with you all for now and we'll see how we go. This is the first one. But it's fascinating for those a little bit into maths. How many Satan night tables take us back to Mitzrayim? So Satan night, first Satan night was 3,000. 300 years ago, which sounds like an awfully long time. However, in fact, if you think about a generation span, generation span is basically 25 years. But actually around a Satan night table in a normal non COVID year, you're gonna find a gap of about 50 years around the table between the oldest and the youngest, possibly more. So 3,300 divided by 25, which would be a single generation, is 132. Divided by 50, is actually 66. There are actually only 66 Seder night tables between us and the coming out of Mitzrayim. It's actually not that far back at all. And it, it, it compacts the whole process of Mesorah, of transmission, and helps us realize it's not that far back. Now, many, many, many years ago, about two nights before Seder, I thought, how can I bring this concept alive for our children? So I had this idea, which is to create, in essence, um, a chain of paper dolls. This is actually a, a nice version. My original version is a very primitive version. And I didn't tell anybody that I was doing this. Came to the Satan night table, I took it out of a box. And actually I had a picture of it, taken from one of the Haggadot, of a man coming out of its right. And I said, this was your great, 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 great grandparents who came out of Egypt. And they taught their children about Satan night and the miracles that they saw. And their children taught their children, and their children taught their children. We pass this around the table. This actually has actually 132 links in the chain. And the surprise at the end was the last four have pictures of my own children on. The last four have pictures of my own children on. Now, so it's, it's, a, it's a, what can I tell you? I think it's a very powerful idea to communicate that unbroken chain of Jewish history across the millennia and it gets passed around the table now you can make it yourself we all used to make these paper chains ourselves you can actually these were bought from hobbycraft they come in packets of six and still need and still need sticking together um but the original one i had was literally made in the old style of concertina paper cutting it out 
and you know the first two or three versions all fall apart, then you work out which way to do it. You don't need to do 132, you can do 66 or less than that to communicate the idea. For those who have done it before, that's Janine and Adam, one, two others, Melissa. So over the years, I've enhanced this by actually adding, as the children got older, a historical dimension to it. And I've asked them to count 10 in. I said, oh, or I said, right, or count uh, eight in, probably it is. That number eight is your great great grand grandparents who came into the land of Israel. Count another four and uh, count another eight in. That is the ones who saw the Beit HaMikdash, Shlomo Melech, and all that was there. Count another eight in. Those unfortunately saw the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. Count 10 in. They survived the Purim episode. So it really comes alive. And as children get older, you can enhance the whole experience by literally talking them through the whole of Jewish history through this. And it's a very powerful way to launch this aid and to say to them, we are now, as our grandparents taught our parents, our parents taught us, we are now teaching you. And it's, uh, I think it's a great way to begin a Seder night. Oops, I've just realized there's one prop, which I, it's 30 seconds away from me. Let me just get it. Okay, um, here is a story. Again, you could use this uh, on Seder night. It's up to you, here is a story. Basically, I'm gonna give you the basic storyline. The basic storyline is children who go visit maybe grandparents and uncles and aunts. And what happens is that in the middle of the table always is a box. And they ask their, they'll say grandfather, what's in the box, grandpa? And grandpa always does the same thing. He takes off his glasses, he rubs his eyes, he says, in the box is the secret of the future of our family. What does that mean? So whenever I've told the story, especially we've got guests around the table, I pick ages that correspond to the age of the children around the table. There was a girl called Sarah, she was eight. There was a boy called Jonathan, he was six. And grandpa used to say, listen, if you can tell me what's in the box, you get a nice prize. One day, Sarah comes in with a crumpled piece of paper, gives it to Grandpa and says, Grandpa, I think I know it's in the box. And he opens the paper, he looks at it, he says, good suggestion. But actually, no, in the box is a secret of the future of our family. And this becomes a mantra through the story. By the time Jonathan comes in, one day they come in, and around the box is a whole lot of chocolates and sweets and all sorts of things. And they say to Grandpa, what's happening? And Grandpa says, well, actually, today, we're going to open the box. Because in the box is the secret of the future of our family. At this point in time, around the same night table, I bring out a box from underneath. From underneath, there's actually a box that seems once prepared, uh, particularly for it, but it doesn't matter. Any, any type of box will do. I bring out a box and I, and I say, what do you think is inside the box? By the way, I pause to ask, how do you think Sharon Jonathan felt at that moment? Were they excited? Were they nervous? Nice chance for the children to express a bit of both. Now, anybody like to suggest what's in the box? You can unmute yourself for a second. Those who know the story, um, don't give it away or put it on chat. Can you unmute yourselves? I believe you can. Can you try somebody? What's in the box? Nothing. No, the secret of the future of our family. That, that's pictures of the children. Pictures of the children. You're pretty close. Inside the box is a mirror. In every generation, a person is obligated to see himself as they came out of the shrine. And I say to them, it's beautiful when the children get a bit of a surprise and then what's inside the box and then it dawns on them. You are the secret of the future of our family. Probably this is relevant for children of about six or seven upwards. Younger than that, I don't think, I think it would be wasted, to be honest. I think it'd be better to wait a year or two longer, but it's a powerful way of putting it. Um, I'm actually going to share with you one more idea. I'm going to show you three out of four. Save one for next year. But here, here is an idea which is um, has actually a very, very profound message for Satan. Very profound message for Satan indeed. Um, and gets the very, very cool what Satan is all about. And certainly would be appropriate for children of key stage two. Produce a finger puppet of some sort. Here is one I made earlier. A very, and if you can see it very well, Simple finger puppet. 
You see that I'm actually going to show you how to make it in old Blue Peter style, and you're all too young to remember Blue Peter, but I'm going to show you how to make it. You might have a puppet at home. Bring it to the second night table. Again, this doesn't have to be used now. These first two ideas were ideas from the beginning of the Seder. This one could be used at a different stage in the Seder. Keep it in your back pocket for when it needs a bit of maybe lifting. Um, and uh, engage them with a the puppet. Hello, what's your name? My name is Puppet. Very simple. Then engage them with the puppet. Get them talking to the puppet. Get them talking to the puppet. Now, once they have started engaging with the puppet, say to them, you realize you're talking to a puppet. And actually, if I take the puppet off my hand, there's a finger controlling the puppet. You know what happened in Mitzrayim, in Egypt? That all of the Egyptians believed that the world ran automatically. There was nobody behind it. There was the laws of nature. And the sun shone because the sun shone, and the rain rained because the rain rained, and the Nile flowed because the Nile flowed. But what Hashem did during the plagues is he took his hands, took the puppet off his hand. He showed them, he turned the whole world upside down, and the Egyptian, even the magicians, were recognized at Sperlokim. It's the finger of Hashem controlling it all. There's a controller behind it all. And what we see is just the external. It's like a puppet. But behind it, Hashem controls. And that gets the very, very essence of what Satan that's all about. Because through the plagues, Hashem demonstrated that he's utterly in charge of everything. And even though it looks automatic, what we interact with is really only the outside, not what the power behind. Now I'm going to show you very quickly how to make one of these very simple finger puppets. I'm sure you've all got puppets at home, but this is so simple. I found it on, of course, the internet. You take an A4 piece of paper, you fold it into, fold it again. Into itself like that. So you have four columns, four columns, four columns. And then you simply do it in half. So you've now got that. So you've got the four columns within. Let me show you again. The four columns within. And now you fold it in half. And here's the only, I won't even call it a complex bit, you fold it each side back on itself. You now have a, an M. Fold it back on itself. And actually, what you now have is places to put your fingers in. Very simple. What you do with it beyond them is up to you. And the one I saw on YouTube, they stuck ears in it and a nose in it and a tongue inside. I decided I wanted to see if I could do it all out of one piece of paper without actually sticking anything on. So I cut up the eyes and the ears, and made the tongue red. You have a finger puppet in minutes. Of course, it's got to be done before saving light, but that is a, a beautiful way of communicating a powerful idea. Okay, now what I'm going to do is move off a little bit from the um, props, shall we call them, and give you five different discussion points in the Seder. Five different discussion points in the Seder, because I think it's very important that we do engage them in discussion. And some of these can be for all age groups. Some will be for the older age groups, but some will be for all age groups. So for example, and, and um, it's so important that we were able to dramatize a little bit so the story comes to life. Here's the first discussion point. When it comes to yacha, breaking the middle matzah, we break the middle matzah and we hide the larger segment away. Yacha. Um, we hide the larger segment away. So why do we do that? So the, well, the reason why we do that is because in Mitzrayim, they were short of food. And a poor man doesn't eat his whole meal in one go. He hides some of it away for tomorrow. So first of all, I have a discussion with the children. What's your favorite food? We go around the table and everybody tell me what's your favorite food. Okay, could you imagine what it would be like if you open the cupboard and the cupboards were completely empty? Not only was there, there wasn't the choice of 10 cereals or five cereals, the cupboards would be empty. And you dramatize it. And a mummy or daddy brings food to the table for supper, but she says, but don't finish it all now because we don't know what food there'll be for tomorrow. You can dramatize it very, very simply. So you've engaged them in the discussion, what's their favorite food? Or what food would they miss the most if they couldn't get it one week? Right. And then bring it alive how difficult it was for the slaves in Mitzrayim. That's one discussion point. 
A second dispersion point, which could be used at any point in the Haggadah, in Avadim Ayinu, or later on in, when it talks about the um, hard work that we were subjected to. Um, actually, I wonder if it would be useful to give you reference, page references from the Art Scroll Family Haggadah. Would that be useful? I think it would. Again, give me, I'm just going to put you on pause for one second. So the Art Scroll Family Haggadah. So this is the Art Scroll Family Haggadah, slightly posher version, but it's excellent to use. So for example, in the Haggadah, um, on page 34, it talks about they gave us hard work, hard labor. So we are told, in fact, because the Egyptians didn't really think about productivity, they just wanted to make life hard for us, they found out what job everybody did not like doing and gave them the job that they were not good at. You can use it at any point in the world. You can use it at the bottom of the unit. You can about 34 and uh, 32 to 34 is where it describes the hard work. That point in the Haggadah. Mm -hmm. So they gave us jobs that we did not like doing. So we would go around the table and ask everybody for their least favorite job. So for example, if one somebody said, I hate tidying up. I hate tidying up. So I would, we would then dramatize you. Do you know what they would do? The Egyptians would make you tidy up all their toys. All of their toys. And once you tidied up all their toys, they would kick the box over and say, I don't like the way you've done it, do it again. Now, of course, you don't want to give out your nightmares, but you do want to bring it alive in a way that they can relate to and in a language they can relate to. That's so, so, so important. Another discussion point, which is a little bit more sophisticated, maybe for those in key stage two. On page 32 in the Haggadah, it says, By Areu Osanu Hamitshin, the Egyptians did evil to us. Actually, translation is, they made us evil. How can you make somebody else evil? Right, discussion point. How can you make somebody else evil? Well, first of all, you can turn one person against another. Secondly, perhaps you could um, so undermine them that they feel bad about themselves. Good chance over here, opportunity over here to show how words can hurt and words can hurt ourselves. Let me keep telling you, you're no good and you're rubbish and you're terrible at that. Those are hurtful words that make us feel bad in our own eyes. A discussion point. One of the most um, important, obviously, points in the Seder, the 10 plagues, is a, a, a fantastic opportunity for two types of discussion. And you could share this one night and the other. So, for example, one discussion would be, what do you think is the scariest plague? Which do you think was the scariest plague and why? Another discussion could be, again, this is a bit more sophisticated, which plague, what do you think they learned about Hashem from the plague? And can you pick a plague where you would have learned something about Hashem? So, for example, they might have learned that Hashem cares for us because you didn't, the plague didn't happen to us. You might have learned that Hashem can, uh, what's the word, distinguish between an animal belonging to a Jew, an Israelite, an animal belonging to an Egyptian, both drinking from the same trough. They might have learned that Hashem's got control even over the smallest things, like the locusts that didn't cross over. Good for the children to think about what did they learn from the plague. And another discussion point which is, uh, again, a little bit more sophisticated. But it, what we're looking for is to engage them in discussion of various points in the Seder. So we, we, we what's the word? We interweave the <clears throat> points of drama, the points of activity, and the points of discussion through the Seder. So that's in a little bit of choreographing, a little bit of planning. And I always write a plan for my Seder night, always, so that I decide which point I'm gonna bring in drama, where I'm gonna bring in a story, uh, where I'm gonna bring in a prop of some sort, that is important. Oh dear, one second. I've got one reference. Yeah, I'm sorry, because of the technical hitch, I got a little bit thrown. I didn't bring everything together. So I'm, I'm going to have to get one more thing out as well. Um, so but that's, that's important. Uh, and this is slightly more sophisticated. And that is, you know, Haggadah says, Maskil Bignus and Messiah Meshavah, that you've got to begin with the degradation and you've got to start with the negative part and then you've got to go to the celebration. Why is it we start with the negative part? Wouldn't it be just nice to focus on the nice bits? We came out of Mitzrayim, we got the Torah, we went to the land of Israel. Why start with the negative part? Koshin Samagid says, it teaches us in life that even if sometimes life is difficult, we can always move forward. I love to make the distinction, this is too much for, for children. There are two types of people in life. There's the only if and the if only. The only if people are the people who say, ah, if only people are the people who say, you know, if only I would have had a better education, 
If only I would have chosen different parents. If only I would have gone to a different school. They spend their whole lives in the world of if only. They don't get much done. The only if, or the people who say, only if I move forward. Only if we take charge. Only if we take responsibility. Okay. Now, so we have, now let me share with you. Of course, when it comes to the Maccas, that is an opportunity to bring in the sketches that the children have prepared, if that's where they prepared them. And then, or it might be, at an earlier stage, they've prepared sketches about the difficulties in the time. That's an opportunity to bring those in at different points. So in your plan of the Seder, then you have decided at what point you're going to bring in the, um, the sketches. I am going to get my Maccas box and try to do this to you again. So, um, in, I often get asked about props of the Seder. So I have accumulated props over the years, and we have a special box in which these props are kept. It actually came once for Charles Monas. It's just a rather nice box with a clasp, and, um, and, and nobody is allowed to touch this box out of Seder night. The tradition is that every single year, although I haven't managed this year, to be honest, we, there's a new animal in the box that so builds it up to the and normally the box is covered and it gets taken out on Arapesa and no one's allowed to open the box. Now I'm going to show you some of the props I've got because I believe in props that really are not party props, but props that really bring it alive. So, for example, let me introduce you to our frog. It was rather a realistic looking frog. He did once have a tongue that came out when he was pressed, but I'm afraid he's tongueless now. Or the snake. I must just tell you that, or. Um, here's a good one. This is a good story that goes with this one. Let me find my locust in here. I also have these tiny little flies, about 10 of them. They're very, very small indeed. And I put them in a cup before, say, night. My children are now teenagers, so they've kind of grown out of this. And I throw them across the table at the right point. Now, I did recommend to people that they buy realistic props. But do so with caution, because a friend of mine told me here is my, well, it's not really a locust. My son would tell me it's not a real locust. It's a, I can't remember exactly what it's called. He's an expert on animals, but you get the idea. Um, so one of the uh, attendees at one of these shirim a few years ago told me that enthusiastically she ordered, oh, here's a locust, um, she ordered a box of life-looking locusts. They came in a jiffy bag in the post. And as she was about to open the jiffy bag, she noticed they were moving. They were live. Believe it or not, they had come in a jiffy bag, in the post, in an envelope, live locust. As she said, she was much too scared to open the box, which had supposed to have the snake in it. So if you are ordering look-alike ones, and you don't want live ones, make sure you know what you're getting. But again, what I, as I say, to my mind, it's about realistic ones that allow us to bring the Seder alive in a very real way. So here we've got um, a goat, a goat, when we talk about the plague of, of the pestilence of Debo, the goat collapses, etc. We've got some hailstones over here, which get thrown across the table. And, and uh, it, it's quite an entertaining part of the Seder. There is one particular Haggadah, which I recommend with a little bit of caution. And it's a fantastic Haggadah, it's the cat's Haggadah. The only caution about it is, is that it is very dramatic indeed. The pictures are outstanding. Some of them are quite gruesome. Some of them are quite gruesome, but every picture is sourced. This is my favorite picture. I don't know if you can see it on Zoom. This is my favorite picture of the Exodus itself. Magnificent picture that brings alive what it must have been like to cross the threshold of Egypt and the walls that came down. It's called the Cat's Haggada, the Art of Faith and Redemption. Um, as I say, um, <coughs> graphic and gruesome. So you have to judge the suitability of that. But it's a fantastic in order to use again through Seder night and to look at it ahead of time and to put some markers in so that you can really uh, bring it alive appropriately. Now we move on to Dayenu. Dayenu is a, is a beautiful opportunity to teach our children the points of gratitude. Unfortunately, probably for most of you this year, I should imagine there will not be grandparents around the table. But how about making, encouraging the children to make Dayenu cards for grandparents ahead of time. In the style of Dayenu, if we only came to your house and you didn't give us nice nush, that'd be enough to say thank you. 
If you gave us a nice lush, but you didn't give us our favorite chocolate biscuits, that'd be a reason to say thank you. Especially if grandparents can't join you this night for Seder, how wonderful it would be if on Erev Pesach, they received a Dayenu card from their grandchildren to express their love for their grandparents for, for uh, all that they do. And it allows us to show our children that gratitude needs to be expressed and gratitude should be itemized. Gratitude should be itemized. That was one of the essence of Dayenu. Um, and, you know, when you go to a Simcha and you come back and you simply say, oh, that was a wonderful Simcha, that's all very good. But if you say the flowers were so beautiful, the music was so tasteful, I love the hors d'oeuvre, someone's gone into effort all of that. The Ainu teaches us that every stage of the way, Hashem made efforts for us. I don't know if you're into numerology, but for those that are, it's fascinating to note uh, that the number 15 features very strongly on Seder night. Now ask your children, all the associations with the number 15 in Judaism. So there are 15 steps from one um, place in the Beit HaMikdash to the other, and we see the Shem Alot, the Song of the Sense. There are 15 stages in the Seder night. There are actually 15 things which we say thank you in Dayenu. 14 Dayenus, but for the first Dayenu covers two things. The name of Hashem is Yud and Hey when said properly. 15 represents the, uh, the moon in the, in the middle of the month, which is at its zenith. 15 in Judaism represents climbing to the top. Climbing to the top. So on Seder night, we're on a journey, a journey from slavery to redemption, climbing to the top, that sense of elevation. By the way, of course, what's the night of Seder night? The 15th of Nisan. What's the night of, Sh of Sukkot? The 15th of Tishri. This is not my idea. This is the Maharal's idea, which he elaborates. He actually goes through um, Dayenu. Again, for those maybe in key stage two, you can actually look at Dayenu as three sets of five in sequence, see if they can spot the sequence in three stages. The exodus from Israel, the looking off into the, in the wilderness, and also the coming into Eretz uh, Israel. Um, I am going to, um, I've been listening very patiently, I'm going to now give you three different stories and show you one final prop. Here's the final prop, which is probably my favorite. This is the original staff of Moshe Rabbeinu. Dates back 300, 3,300 years. Yes, this is the original one. Um, uh, and basically, it's half a broomstick, half a broomstick, which has got paintings on it. It was actually made for me, an activity we once did in the school, the parents and children together, half a broomstick. Uh, and again, either you can make it yourself and produce it as a Satan like prop, or you could ask for the children to make it, or they could all make one. Uh, it doesn't have to be a half a broomstick, it can be um, carbon rolls of some sort. But it's it's a great prop to have. Of course, it's an enormous amount because we know the formula for the plagues was inscribed on the staff of Moshe Rabbeinu himself. Okay, I'm going to share with you now three stories. I would never normally tell three stories in sequence. I've just segmented this evening into different parts, and you can. I'm going to share, tell you where to use these stories throughout the say night. So yeah, well, two two stories and then one a way of telling a story. Here's a great story, an important story. Uh, quite a well-known story. I don't know if the children have heard it from school. But this is a story that captures one of those key messages that we are the ambassador nation of, of Hashem. Because the story could be asked, that actually, you know, it's great that we're having Seder night, but we don't have a temple yet. We don't have a Beit HaMikdash. We have Medina Israel, but it's not without its problems and its challenges and security issues. Like, and for many, many years, for most of our Jewish history, we didn't have that. So why are we celebrating? Why do we celebrate all those thousands of years without Eretz Israel? What was it to celebrate? I mean, we had redemption, but surely we lost it again. It's a classic Satan night story. There was a man who was not brought up with any education and life was not so easy. And every so often he bought himself a lottery ticket. And you can explain, you should check numbers each week. I'm not really encouraging buying him lottery tickets, but every so often he bought himself a lottery ticket. And one day he checks his ticket and he can't believe it. His numbers have come through. He's won a fortune. And you can explain how he's a nice man, an intelligent man, and he moves into a bigger house, but he has more guests, and you can have a discussion. What would you do um, if you won a lottery ticket? One of the things he gets himself is education. He's never been educated. He goes to a wonderful school like Beit Shvidla. He learns music, and he learns art, and he learns maths, and he learns English. All we go around the table, what would be your favorite topic? 
And every year on the anniversary of his win, he would have a celebration with all of his friends. Every single year, a nice party, they get together, and nice food, celebration. But as we know that sometimes a person can be maybe wealthy for a while, and it's not, Shem may decide that they're not always going to be so wealthy. And although he celebrates for many, many, many years, the day comes when some of his business doesn't go so well. And actually, he has to sell his big house, go back to a smaller house, and things are not so easy for him. And all his friends think to themselves, there'll be no party this year. What a shame. There'll be no party this year. But in fact, to their surprise, they get an invitation. It's not quite as thick as in previous years, and it doesn't have gold lettering on his previous years, but it invites him to a party. They come to his house, a bit of a squash because it's a smaller house, and the food is much more modest, and they're waiting for him to explain why the party. I mean, you haven't got it anymore. He says, I bet you're all wondering why we have a party this year. Of course, everyone's too polite to say, yeah, we've all been talking about it and wondering why you've got a party this year. I thought you might be. Yes, it's true that I no longer have the luxuries that I have. But you forget, I gained an education. I became a different person. That can't be taken away from me. That's who I am. When Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, he took us out to give us the Torah, as we say in Dayenu, to give us that ambassador role of the Jewish people. Now, even though we've had difficult times and been out of exile, out of the land of Israel, more than we were in the land of Israel, but that's who we are. We have the Torah, we can study Torah, we can teach Torah, we can live as Hashem's ambassadors in this world. That can never be taken away from us. And that is the climax on the same night. And no, that was the goal of it all. One story. And again, that story could be used almost at any stage in the Seder. It could be used at um, Halach Mania, it's often used. <clears throat> and there's variations on that story. Uh, it could be used at Dayenu, when we talk about giving the Torah. In a way, I'm, I'm quite inclined to use it towards the end of Magid, so that that's the message the children get, that we are ambassadors in Hashem's world. Uh, another story. This is a, a story, competition in the jungle. There was once a competition in the jungle to see who could roar the loudest. And the monkey came forward. Maybe everyone around the table and they do some monkey noises. Shriek like a monkey. And they measured, oh gosh, it could be heard. In the jungle, it could be heard a mile away. Then the elephant came forward. I don't know what you call an elephant's bellow. Is it a bellow? I don't know. But whatever it did, it did it with great force. And then the king of the jungle, a lion, came forward and gave such a roar to be heard several miles away. And everybody stepped back in awe of the lion because surely the king of the jungle had taken the prize. To everybody's surprise, a little jungle bird, tropical bird came forward. He said, could I have a go, please? And the judges looked at the bird and said, the king of the jungle has just roared. It's been measured seven, eight miles away. What are you going to do? The bird said, would you mind? And they said, well, you want to. And they all tried to stop themselves from laughing. And the bird gave a little beautiful song. A few seconds later, the song was responded to with another bird song. A colleague bird, half a mile down the road, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, until the sound was transmitted from bird to bird, miles and miles and miles away. And even the king of the jungle had to acknowledge that that won the competition. That's what Seder night is. We're not the loudest of people. We're amongst the smallest. We hardly register on a world census. I think it's point not one of the world population. We've never attempted to be the loudest of people. But our voice has carried through all the millennia because we've transmitted it from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. That could, a story that could be shared at the time, for example, of their four sons, the importance of engaging the next generation, or towards the end of Magid, of a Dar Radar, in every generation, in every generation, which in the Arts Kol Haggadah is on page 44 just before we go in for the meal. And that is uh, a beautiful way of communicating to our children they are part of the transmission process. So um, hopefully, I'm very happy to take questions or comments, or hopefully, just to summarize, what we've done is a build-up to say tonight, preparation. We've talked about um, three uh, ideas that are more vivid, the, the men, the chain of people, 
the mirror in the box, the finger puppet. We have also talked about some discussion points. The uh, scariest play, uh, yachats, dramatizing the uh, poor man's bread. And we talked about the scariest plague and the reverse work, and they made us life difficult for us. We talked about sketches that children could do, the Dayenu cards, and some of the stories. Let me finish with one final thought, because one of the things that, that I always found very useful, or, uh, it just, this just needs a little bit of practice, is to actually create a story about a family that lived at the time. We created one about a family called Yisraeli family. And actually, the story started with us on Shabbos HaGadol. And we talked about a, a family that lived in the time of Israel, and we chose children of similar ages to our own children. And the, uh, the, the, as uh, any great teacher will tell you, the trick with a good story is a simple storyline well described. So I want to tell you about the Israeli family. They lived 3,300 years ago in Mitzrayim. Daddy worked so, so hard. You know that um, your parents work hard, but he worked so, so hard, they never saw him in the morning. They never saw him in the evening. When he came home, he was so exhausted. He dramatized the story. Shabbos Agotten, you might talk about the fact that um, Moshe Rabbeinu had come and they had to take the lamb and, and, and keep it in their houses for four days and run up to tears with Ryan. And then say to them that you can continue the sequence of the story. You might tell them, and actually what's beautiful about this is that through Pesach, you can add parts to the story. What was it like to come out of Mitzrayim for the first time? We once told the whole story of how they came out of Mitzrayim and the little sister remembered she'd left her doll behind. And the brother goes back to rescue the doll, going back across the rubble into Mitzrayim, into their very basic house to rescue her straw doll that she'd made with such love and to take it back into the simple story, simple storyline, well described. Came back into Mitzrayim and the Egyptians were, were horrified to see him back, but nobody touched him. They were too scared to touch him. And he ran through the rubble. We saw the holes in the houses of the roofs of, um, we saw the holes from the, from the uh, sorry, he saw the, the damage caused by the borov. He saw that some people were crying because of Makas Bukharos. And he looks through their house to find the doll. The house had been empty, nothing much left. Not they had much in the first place. And there, under a bench, he finds the doll. Comes running back to catch up with his family. Sees a million that dramatize the story in a simple way. You can run through Pesach. Um, in fact, on the last day of Pesach, the seventh day of Pesach, on the last day, we used to do a game called the Tzies Mitzrayim game. Um, with the children, there was, uh, because, it, because you know, Pesach, kind of, you have Seder night, and what comes next? So on the seventh or eighth day of Pesach, we would get them all together in the afternoon, got a big blue towel, which looks like the sea, and then we'd reenact the coming out of Mitzrayim, and then each have their little wheelies or bags or cases, um, and we would then march around the garden, jump across the towel, and come back for a bit of a feast <laughs> to celebrate it is the shrine. So hopefully those are some helpful ideas. I'm happy for you to um, unmute yourselves if you have any questions. Uh, and if you'd like to add yourself, I'm always open to hearing new ideas and uh, share them on my own side of my table. So please feel free.